you the Colorado classroom, learn with me at home. I'm Mrs. T. Welcome to another episode. I'm so glad that you are joining us today. A little bit about myself. I am a teacher. I teach fifth grade at Brantner Elementary School in the Brighton 27J School District. Hi to all my bangles out there. I've been teaching for 12 years now. I have taught kindergarten for many years, first grade, second grade, and fourth and fifth. I love teaching every grade. I love working with children, and my very favorite part about working with children is teaching kids how to read. That is my favorite to do. I love letters. I love teaching students letter sounds. I am so glad that you're here on this journey with me. I have a wonderful lesson planned for us today. Because it is Earth Week, we are going to be discovering and exploring materials that are found on Earth. Can you take a guess? This is something, I'll give you a clue. Our topic for today can be found in your backyard. It is Earth Week and we're going to explore materials found on Earth, what could you find in your backyard? It may be grass, but that's not it. Maybe a swing set? Nope. A table? Nope. It's this. What is this? This is a rock. Mm -hmm. You might have some in your front yard or your backyard or on your street. This is a rock. That's what we will be exploring today. Rocks and minerals. So take a seat and join me. On my learning board today, we have the word read and write. Read starts with a R, R, and right starts with a W, 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 a W. That's right. Now remember, anytime I go over letters or colors or numbers, I want you to help me and participate with me. I want you to repeat what I am saying so that you learn, so that you Get the information stuck in your brain so that you grow your brain. Anytime I move, I want you to move. Meaning if we do a song and a dance, I want you to get up and do a song and a dance with me. All right, you ready? Let's hit it. Here's our alphabet chart. We have the letters of the alphabet. Today, I don't want to start with A. I want to go backwards. Let's go backwards. I thought that might be fun. The last letter of the alphabet is Z. And Z makes Z. Say that with me. Z. Good. For zigzag or zebra. The next letter is Y. 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 Y for yellow, which I have some yellow here. I've got lots of yellow on my board. And yo-yo, very good. X, make a X with your hands. You crisscross your hands, X, and say X, X, X. X for x-ray. W, I was making that earlier. You can make two L's, use your index and your thumb, put your two thumbs together, and say wa, wa, wa. W for window. Mm -hmm. Or wiggle. A V, which you could make with your two index fingers. Put them together at the base. And V for vacuum. And volleyball, if you like to play volleyball. U, uh, uh, uh. U for umbrella. Mm -hmm. And unicorn. T is next for t t Teague, that's me. Does your name start with a T too? 
Make a T with your fingers. T -t -t. Good job. Make sure you're saying, saying the letter and the sounds with me. S, 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 like snake or like strawberry. Do you like snakes or strawberries? R, R, for run, right? We move our hands back, we move our arms back and forth when we run. Run. What else starts with R? Rainbow, ribbon. Mm -hmm. Q, qua, qua. I like to do this because a queen wears a crown on her head. Queen starts with Q, qua, qua. What else starts with Q? Quiz, quick, mm -hmm. quiet, P, 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 for push, p, 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 or for pig, right? A piggy, or for pink, the color. I think I have pink here on my wall. Yeah, right here, I've got a little bit of pink. O, ah, ah, for octopus, mm -hmm. or open, open a door, ah. Oh, and the color orange, right here. Orange starts with O. N, mm, 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 mm. for nose, N for nose. M, mm, mm, mm. M for money, or monkey. L, love, L for love. K for k, 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 k for kick or for kangaroo. J for jump, J for jump. Good, and what else starts with J? Juice. I, 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 little I, right, I, I, for itch. Mm-hmm, good job. H, for horse and for hop. H, G, 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 green, for green. Green starts with G, G. F, f for foot, mm -hmm. for f, good. E, F, 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 for eyes, mm -hmm. and D, D, for dog. Do you have a dog? Hi to your little doggy at home. D for dog, and C, K, 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 for cat. Do you have a cat? Hi to your cat at home. And B for b, b, ball. Mm -hmm. Do you like to play ball? Maybe soccer ball, baseball, football? And A for a, a, alligator, snap, snap, or apple. Good, good job doing the letters and, and the sounds. Let's go over our numbers. Let's start with number one. Count with me. One, two, three, four, five. What comes after five? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What comes after ten? Eleven, twelve. Good. Let's do some practice counting on. If I say two, what comes after two? Three. Good. If I say five, what comes after five? Six. And what comes before two? That's a tricky one. One. One comes before two. And what comes before nine? So eight, nine. So eight comes before nine. And what comes after nine? Nine, ten. Good job. Ten is a one and a zero. A one and a zero. Let's head over here to colors and shapes. We have a red square. It has four sides. Count the sides. One, two, three, four. All four sides are the same length. That's what makes it a square. We have purple rectangle. A rectangle also has four sides, but it has two long sides and two short sides. The sides are not all the same. Green. 
and a green triangle. Tri means three, so it has three sides. Count. One, two, three. It has three points. One, two, three. Blue. Blue circle. Right. No sides. It goes around and around and around. Yellow diamond. A diamond has one, two, three, four sides. Four points. Orange. Orange oval. Oval starts with O. Orange and oval start with O. And it also goes around and around. I kind of call it an oval is like a stretched out circle. And over here I have kindergarten. And this lesson is for all the kindergartners out there. And if you're not in kindergarten, that's okay. You can sit and join me and watch me too. Okay? All right, well, good job, my friends. I cannot wait to tell you all about our lesson today. Like I said, we are going to be talking about rocks. My daughter, Emery, she loves collecting rocks. She has a rock collection and she wanted to share that with you all. So these are a couple of her rocks that she's found on our adventures or just in our backyard. Pretty neat, right? What color is this rock? Starts with a B. It's black. Do I have black on my wall? I do. My, my letters are in black. Those kindergarten board is in black. Mm -hmm. Black, B-L-A-C-K, black. It's pretty heavy too, really hard. This rock has white and a little bit of, I would say like a brownish color. Can you see that? Almost looks like some crystals on this side. So we are going to be exploring rocks. Mm -hmm. Over here, I want to tell you about a special person. A geologist. Can you say geologist? It's a big word. A geologist is a person who studies rocks. It's a job that you could do when you grow up. You could be a geologist. A geologist are the scientists who study what the earth is made up of rocks and minerals. Rocks and minerals. Hmm. Well, I think you're probably familiar with rocks, but maybe you're not so familiar with minerals. And that's okay. We're going to learn about minerals too today. So a geologist is a scientist who studies what the earth is made of. Like I said, it is Earth Week. And rocks are a material that we find on Earth. Mm -hmm. Now you may be asking, oh, I know what a rock is. I've seen a rock. You know, rocks are just ordinary. We see them all the time. Ordinary means, you know, just simple. It may not be that exciting. But rocks are super exciting and it is really important that we understand our earth and we learn about our earth, which is where we live. It's the planet that we live on. So a rock, and this is how you spell rock. R, you say it with me, R-O-C-K. R, sound it out, R, A, and then C-K. We don't say K, K. We just give it one sound. It's R. Rock. Rock. Good job reading, kindergartner. A rock is a solid. A rock is a solid object made up of two, number word, two or more minerals. Now I mentioned minerals. You may not be familiar with that. So let me tell you what a mineral is. Can you say minerals? Starts with a 
Minerals. Minerals. I'll tell you what a mineral is. Minerals. Minerals are the building blocks. Building blocks that make up rocks. Let's say it one more time. I like it. It kind of rhymes. Minerals are the building blocks that make up rocks. So, let me go back to my rock. I'm telling you that this is a rock and the minerals is what makes up this rock. Pretty neat. You just learned what a mineral is and you learned the definition of what a rock is. Those are our main vocabulary words for today. So we discuss what a mineral is and when a, a group of minerals form together, it creates the rock. Do you know that we use minerals every day? You have some inside your house. I have some right here. This is a salt shaker. Can you see the salt inside? That salt is a mineral. Mm -hmm. It's a mineral. It's found on Earth. Do you see my ring? Right here, this is gold. That's also a mineral. And these diamonds, that's part of Earth too. It's found in the ground. This gold is also a mineral. And so is the diamond. Pretty neat. And they're beautiful, aren't they? You might have salt at your house or some gold. You have minerals in your home. Well, since we are talking about rocks today, I thought it would be a great time to rock out. Grab your guitar. If you don't have one, get your air guitar. Stand up and rock out with me. Let's hit it. out right it's good to get your heartbeat up so that we can grow our brains now it's time to slow our breath down so let's take some deep breaths in your nose smell the flowers and blow out the candles ready in and out one more time always good to get a little exercise in. Let's get started for our lesson. So I have a little experiment that I'm going to have my daughter Emery do. Like I told you, she loves rocks. She's in kindergarten. She has a rock collection. Here are some of the rocks that she has. If you can see, I see lots of different colors. Rocks, are, are many different colors. They also have different texture, how they feel. Some might be smooth and others are rough and pointy. Some have stripes and some look like crystals. I do have, I think, a few gemstones in here, some gems. So I'm going to have, I'm going to give her these rocks and I'm going to have her sort them. Sorting means that she's going to group the rocks by different characteristics. And I'm not going to tell her how. I'm just going to tell her, sort these rocks by their characteristics. So she may sort them 
all the white rocks together and all the black rocks together. That's sorting. Maybe if you have been at school before and your teachers ask you to sort some blocks and you put all the red blocks together and all the green blocks together or the blocks that are large and the blocks that are small. So maybe I want to put these two rocks together because they're white. That's called sorting. We group them in ways that they are alike. So do you want to follow along with us and have a little experiment? Hi friends, I'm Emery and I'm gonna sort these rocks. This one feels rough and I'm gonna put it into a circle. This one feels smooth. I'm gonna put it into another circle. This one feels rough again. And this one feels smooth. This one feels rough. And this one feels smooth. I'm just putting them in like the circles, like how they feel, if they feel rough or smooth. Okay, what rocks are in this group? There is... How would you describe this group of rocks? The, all of these rocks, all of these, all of these rocks are rough and all of these rocks are smooth. So that's how you grouped them? Yep. Is there a different way you could group these rocks? Um, I could put those there and these there. Okay, but is there another way that you could organize these rocks? I could spread them out and put them in a line. Okay. Or put them in order and count them. I'm going to sort these to white and colorful. So what are these? What group is this? They are white. These rocks have white on them, okay? Yep. And what mm -hmm. are you going to place here? I'm gonna place all the colorful rocks there. Okay, go ahead. Now I'm gonna sort the colorful rocks. What about this one? Tell me why you put that one there. Because it's part green. Oh, so you know, it's a little white, mm -hmm. it's still more green. What if I did that and put it in the middle? It would be kind of like a bow. Okay, but if we put this one in the middle, that means it has a little bit of white and it has a little bit of color. It has both. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when we sort things, they don't fit perfectly within a certain group. Do you want to finish the rest? Tell me why you put that one in the middle too. Because it's white, kind of. It has a little bit of white? Mm-hmm. Great job, Ann. And it's kind of yellow. Bye. Now I'm going to have Emery and a special guest conduct a test that geologists use to classify rocks. The word classify, can you say that? Classify. C-L-A-S-S-I-F-Y. That means to classify things means to place them in different categories or groups. Very similar to sorting, which is what she did earlier. We classify things based on their characteristics. And geologists use specific characteristics or traits that rocks have, such as hardness. So how hard a rock is. Hey, Emery and Eric, how's your test going? Hi, Mom. Hi, friends. <laughs> We're just getting our experiment started right now. So this is our chart that we made to test the hardness of things. This uses what's called the Mohs hardness test. Show me your fingernails. Okay, your fingernails are at 2.5 on the Mohs hardness scale. And show me the penny. Okay, the penny is a three to four on the Mohs hardness scale. And show me this, the steel nail. Okay, now that's a 6.5 on the Mohs hardness scale. So right here we have five different rocks. We have talc, 
we have desert rose, we have malachite, we have quartz, and we have corundum, which is those little black spots inside there. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna test to see which one we can scratch with our nail, which one we can scratch with a penny, and which one we can scratch with the steel nail. So which one do you think is the softest? Um, hmm, that one. The malachite? Okay, so you think the malachite is the softest? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so do me a favor, pick that up and try and scratch it with your nail. Okay, let's take a look. All right. I don't see any scratches on there, do you? No. No. Okay. So I think this is the softest. This is talc. You see scratches on there? Did it come off on my nail? Mm -hmm. See that little white powder right there? So that is soft. Talc is actually, they make powder out of that. Yep. So now let's try this. Since, the, since our fingernail didn't work on the malachite, let's try and scratch it with a penny. Mm -hmm. Try and scratch it. Try and scratch that surface with a penny. Okay, so it puts some marks on there. And I don't know if you guys at home can see, but there are some little shiny marks from the, where the penny scratched the malachite. Okay, now, so that's next in hardness. So let's see. Our fingernail scratched the talc, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're gonna put an X next to that. And did the fingernail scratch the malachite? No. No. So we're not we're gonna put a straight line through there. Okay, now did the penny scratch the malachite? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so we're gonna put an X next to that. So since the nail is harder than the penny, do you think the nail will scratch the malachite? Yes. I think so too. Let's check. Uh-oh, now I'll put big marks on there. Look at that, guys. Big scratches on there. Okay, so we know that the nail will scratch the malachite. Now, do you think the nail will scratch those little black spots on this? This is called corundum. No. No? I don't think so either. Okay, so we're gonna scratch right there. Now, corundum is the little black spots inside the green rock. Okay, so you can see the nail scratched the green rock, but it didn't scratch the black rock. And corundum is the same mineral that makes sapphires and rubies. And the only difference, I like rubies, I like rubies too. The only difference is that rubies are red and sapphires are blue and every other color except red, but they're the same mineral. Have you ever seen a white sapphire before? No. No? I don't think so. You see my watch? Okay, so this crystal right here, this is made out of sapphire or corundum, which is the same mineral that those little black dots are. So my watch, I don't, I wouldn't want to damage it, right? Do you think I should try and take this nail and scratch the crystal on my watch? No. No? What if we did it like this? Am I scratching it? Well, it Do you see any scratches? Scratching. There's no scratches on there. That's because that's a really, really, really hard mineral. Okay, so we know that corundum is hard and we already tested the talc and we tested the malachite and we put a nice little scratch on there. Okay, so now we have the desert rose and we have quartz. Which one do you think is the hardest out of those two? Um, that one. You think the desert rose is the hardest? Mm -hmm. Okay, take it and try and scratch it with your fingernail. Hold it over the tray, and then you'll see if any dust comes off. I don't see Let me try it. Oh, look at that. See, it's crumbling. Mm -hmm. See, so that is soft. If your fingernail can scratch it. So we'll put an X for our fingernail for the desert rose. And now let's check the quartz. Okay, try and scratch it with your nail. Okay, let's try and scratch it with my nail. I don't think so, it's just putting a big scratch in my nail. Okay, so now let's try and scratch it with the penny.
Now look at the penny. Did it scratch the penny? Watch. Look at that. It scratched the penny right on the edge of it. So we know that it's too hard for your nail and it's too hard for the penny. So that doesn't work. And now let's see. So not the nail, not the penny. And how about the steel nail? Should we try that? Yeah. Okay, so I don't even see any scratches on the quartz from the steel nail, which is a 6.5 on the hardness scale. So quartz, apart from corundum, quartz and corundum are the winners. What do you think about that test? Is that pretty neat? Mm -hmm. All right, well, bye guys. Bye. Did you have fun being a geologist today? A geologist is a scientist who studies rocks. You did a fabulous job. Do you remember what the word rock means? I know you know what a rock is. A rock is a solid object made up of two or more minerals. And do you remember what a mineral is? Minerals are the building blocks that make up rocks. Remember, it kind of rhymes. And you did two experiments, just like a real geologist. We sorted rocks and we classified rocks. Classify is a commonly used test the geologists use out in the field when they're taking rock samples. Classify means to place them in different categories or groups. Just like Eric and Emery tested the hardness of the rocks and then classified them based on their hardness, just like a real geologist. Wow, what a great topic for Earth Week, right? Rocks and minerals, fascinating. It's what, it's what our Earth is, what our Earth is made out of. I hope you have some time to go and be a geologist out in your own backyard. Go explore, look for rocks, maybe just start a rock collection, or conduct your own experiment. Classify and sort your rocks, maybe based on color, or hardness, or their luster, or just the type of rock it is. Did you know that in Colorado, in our own backyard, we have tons of limestone. Limestone is a rock. Mm -hmm. You can find it all over, especially where there's water, nearby the water. Well, I had a wonderful time with you. Thank you so much for joining me on the Colorado Classroom. Learn with me at home. I'm Mrs. T. Have a wonderful day. Bye. Mrs. Teague, and I'm going to do a math minute with you. Our topic is number recognition and counting. Let's get started. Number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Let's review. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let's continue. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 
18, 19, 20. Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. Great job with number recognition and counting. Welcome back to Colorado Classroom, learn with me at home. I'm Mrs. Radu, and I have another important question for you today. What is this word? And what does it mean? It's such a silly word. Can you help me figure it out? Okay, first, let's just say the sounds, okay? Let's try it, ready? Sp, L, um, ing hmm let's start with just this part ready that part says spell and then we have unk and then we have ing that looks like three separate syllables so it goes spell unk ing spelunking can you say that with me spelunking can you clap it with me Spell unking. Spelunking. That's a super silly word, isn't it? Have you ever heard it before? Hmm. I was a long time before I first heard that word. It's an interesting one. What does spelunking mean? Do you know? Well, spelunking is exploring caves. Have you ever been inside a cave before? What is a cave like? What do we know about caves already? It's usually pretty dark, maybe kind of damp, maybe a little bit chilly. Hmm, sometimes you find bats in caves. Not always, but sometimes. So those are some things that we know about caves, but I bet there's a lot more to learn, isn't there? I'm also really wondering, how are caves formed? Like, how are they created? Did somebody just dig a big hole in the ground? Hmm, I don't think that's right because caves are usually natural, right? Hmm, well, I want to learn more about this. So, I think that we better go and do a little bit of reading about this. Does that sound like a plan to you? Okay, let's go. Taking a look at the word spelunking, made me excited to learn more about what it is. It made me excited to learn more about how caves are formed, but it also made me kind of excited to think about how words are so interesting and they sound kind of funny and cool sometimes. So as we're reading, we're not only going to pay attention to what spelunking is and how our caves formed, but we're also going to notice interesting words so we can have some fun with words when we're done reading. Okay, so as we're reading, we are going to pay attention and when you notice a word that is just kind of a cool word or an interesting word, I want you to shout it out, okay? I might not catch all of them, but I'll catch as many as I can and I'll highlight them. Then we'll have some fun exploring with words when we're done reading, okay? Let's do it. This is called Let's Go Spelunking. If you're wondering what in the world spelunking is, you're not alone. Did you notice any cool words in that first sentence? Yeah, spelunking. I agree, that's a fun word, isn't it? Spelunking is cave exploring, and you might be surprised to learn that you can go spelunking right here in Colorado. How about any interesting words in that sentence? I like the word exploring. 
And of course, Colorado. Colorado is home to many caves. One of the most famous caves is called Cave of the Winds and was discovered by two schoolboys in 1881. Discovered, that's a nice word. However, legend leads many to believe that the Ute and Apache tribes actually knew about it for centuries before that. Oh my goodness, there's so many interesting words in that sentence. Let's listen. I heard legend and believe and Ute and actually and centuries. So many interesting words. Cave of the Winds was formed when water began to dissolve a mineral called calcite in the limestone. Whoa, a lot of cool words there too, like dissolve and mineral, calcite and limestone. As the water drips off of the rock, it leaves a trace of calcite behind, which slowly builds up on the ceiling to form a stalactite. Well, let's see. We already noticed um, the word calcite before, so we don't need to highlight it again. But I kind of liked the word ceiling. I think it's cool because normally you'd think that a word that begins with the s sound would begin with an S, but it actually starts with a C. And stalactite, that's a really cool word. I wanna know what a stalactite is. A stalactite is kind of like an icicle made out of calcite instead of ice. All right, cool. So it's like an icicle, I like icicles, made out of calcite instead of ice. When the water drips onto the ground, the calcite builds up again and creates a stalagmite. Whoa, stalactite and stalagmite, cool words. Sometimes the stalactite and stalagmite grow large enough that they reach one another and turn into a column or pillar. Ooh, I like this word, enough and pillar. It can be hard to remember which is a stalactite and which is a stalagmite. It helps to remember that stalactite, stalactites form on the ceiling and that begins with a C, but stalagmites form on the ground and that begins with a G. Oh, that's so cool. So did you see that? We learned that stalactites, this one that has a C in it, Stalactites form on the ceiling, while stalagmites with a G form on the ground. So if you remember that ceiling begins with C and G begins with ground, and you remember where these two things form, it'll help you remember which one is a stalactite and which one is a stalagmite. That's a really cool trick. Nicely done, my friends. Good reading, and thank you for helping me find so many interesting words. I really like this passage because finding interesting words is really fun. Now, I think that we should go and have a little bit of fun playing with these interesting words, okay? Let's do it. Okay, learning about spelunking and caves and especially all of those really interesting words was really fun. Now, I wanna take those interesting words and figure out how many syllables they have. One, two, three, or four, okay? You can help me. We practiced clapping the syllables when we learned the word spelunking at the beginning. So, let's keep going, okay? Our first word is, you guessed it, spelunking. Let's say it while clapping the syllables, ready? Remember, syllables are the big sounds in the word. Here we go. Sp, lung, king. How many syllables? Show me on your fingers. Three, good job. Spelunking, good work. Our next word is exploring. Let's clap it, here we go. 
exploring. How many syllables? Show me. Three. Again, good job. Awesome. Our next word is Colorado. Ready? Call o rad o. Ooh, that was a lot. How many syllables that time? Four. Very cool. Nicely done. Our next word is discovered. Ready? Here we go. Discovered. Three. Good job. Excellent. All right, let's keep going. Our next word is legend. Ready? Ledge end. Just two that time. Good work. Our next one is believe. Leave. Two again. Nicely done. Our next one is Ute. Ready? Here we go. Ute. Ooh, just one. That's our shortest one yet. Okay, next is actually. Ready? Actually. Actually. How many syllables? Four. Nice work. Our next one is centuries. Ready? Here we go. Centuries. How many syllables? Three is right. Okay, our next word is limestone. This time you try it first. Show me how many syllables and then we'll do it together. Ready? Limestone, go. How many? Let's check. Limestone. Two. Nice job. You got it. Nicely done. Okay, our next one is stalactite. Okay, you try this one again. Ready? Stalactite. How many syllables? Let's try it together. Stalactite. Three. You got it. Nicely done. How about icicle? You do this one again. Icicle. Go ahead. How many syllables? Icicle. Three. A lot of them have three, don't they? Good work. How about stalagmite? Almost like stalactite, but it's on the ground. Ready? Stalagmite. How many syllables? Three is right. Nicely done. Our next word is enough. You do this one. Enough. How many syllables? Two is right, good job. And last but not least is pillar. Ready? Let's do it together. Pillar. Two. Awesome. Wow, look at all those words. Nicely done. Thanks for figuring out how many syllables each of them has with me. You did great. Syllables are a fun way to explore interesting words, but there are other ways too. Let's take a look at just a couple of those words that we just talked about in a little bit more detail. For example, let's think about the word discovered. Discovered. Three syllables, right? Well, what if I got rid of this first syllable, dis? What if I got rid of that one? What would be left? Hmm? Cov. Erd. Covered. Look at that. Covered. That's still a word, isn't it? If I covered myself with my sleeping bag, that's a word. 
but discovered means to find something new. So if you just change, if you add, add or take away one syllable, it totally changes the word. It's really interesting, I think. Okay, let's think at, let's look at another word, okay? Let's think about our short word that we talked about. Ute, right? If we have our word ute, let's just listen to the sounds in the word ute, not syllables this time, each individual sound. Ready? U t. How many sounds? Two. U t. Two sounds. Okay, so we have two sounds. U t. Ute. Well, what if I put k on the front? Now I have k. U t. What word is that? Cute. That's right. I changed the word ute into cute just by adding one sound. Nice job. Now I want to look at the word limestone. Limestone. Let's see. Limestone. How many syllables was that one again? Two. So I only need two of these. I'll put one of these back. Limestone. Limestone. Now I want to try something. I want to take away one of those syllables. Okay? Limestone. Limestone. I'm going to take away lime. Bye bye, lime. Now I just have stone. Let's listen to the sounds in stone. Ready? S, t, o, n. Listen to that sound at the end. N, like nose. I want you to change that sound to er, like red. So now this is going to be er when we touch it again. Ready? S, t, o, er. Hmm, what word is it now? It's not stone anymore. What is it? S, t, o, er. Store. We changed that word to store. Nice job. Let's go back to our word limestone. We'll put lime back in there. Let's get rid of the other part of the word this time, the other syllable. Instead of getting rid of lime, let's get rid of stone. What do we have left? Lime, that's right. This word is lime. Let's say the sounds, ready? U, I, M. Mm. Three sounds, U, I, M. Mm. Now this first sound right here is what? L, right? L. I want you to change that L to T. This time, when we say the sounds, we're gonna start with T. Here we go. T, I, M. Mm. What word does that make? Time! Nice job! We changed lime to time and stone to store. So sometimes just changing one sound can make a big difference. Okay, let's do one more. Ready? Let's think about the word icicle, okay? Let's clap that out so that we can remember how many syllables there are. Ready? Help me out. Icicle. Icicle. How many syllables? Three is right. Okay, so let's put our three magnets back up. Ice, eh, cool. Icicle, okay. Here's my word icicle, but what if I want to add, uh, on the beginning. Not adding any extra syllables, just one sound. That would change to bite. S, C, L. What word? Bicycle. You got it. Nice job. Awesome. So I think it's so much fun to find interesting new words, figure out what they mean, and then play with them, kind of like they're Legos. Take them apart, put them back together, figure out what new things you can create with them, because words are fun. Okay? Thanks so much for playing with words with me. Okay, let's make some stalactites. The first step is to get some water really hot, but not quite boiling. Make sure that you only do this if you're working with an adult. We never want to do anything with the stove by ourselves, right? Okay, so we filled up a pot with water. We turned on the stove with an adult helping us, and we are getting it nice and hot. You can maybe even see that there's some steam coming off of this. It's really, really hot, but it's not boiling. We don't want it to be boiling. We just want it hot. 
because we want to dissolve salt in our water, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna dump in a whole bunch of salt. There isn't a specific amount, so you don't need to measure it. What I'm gonna do is use a spoon or a whisk or some type of tool to mix it up. And I'm gonna spend some time dissolving salt and then adding some more and mixing it up and adding some more and mixing it up until it doesn't dissolve anymore. So there isn't a special amount like one cup or two cups. Instead, we're going to keep going until it doesn't dissolve anymore. You'll know when it doesn't dissolve anymore when you look at the bottom of the pot and you can tell if there's still some salt on the bottom, you'll be able to see the little tiny pieces, the granules, but if it's all been dissolved, then it'll just look like water, okay? So we're gonna do that now. Okay, now I can tell that I've dissolved as much salt as this water can handle because there's still a little bit of salt resting at the bottom, which means that the water can't absorb any more salt. So it's as salty as it can get. Now it's time for us to turn off the stove and let the water cool down for a little bit and then we'll be ready for our next step. While we're waiting for our salt water to cool down, let's get the next step ready, okay? so. We have two glass containers. We have a rolled up paper towel. You can also use a piece of string, it's up to you. And we have some paper clips on the ends. Those are for weights to help hold it in place. And then we have some little clips. These are optional, okay? So what we wanna do right now is kind of build a bridge between the two jars using either your string or your rolled up paper towel, okay? So what we're gonna do is put one end in either side in each jar, okay? I'm gonna scoot them close to each other, close enough that there is room for the paper towel to be able to bend it down in the middle once it gets wet, okay? But it also needs to be inside the jar far enough that it will stay in place, okay? Let's see, we're going to use our clips to help keep the paper towel in the spot that we want it to stay. So I'm gonna decide where I think is a good spot and then I'm gonna use the clip and clip the edge of the paper towel to the side of the jar. Just be a little bit helpful in making sure that it stays, whoops, <laughs> making sure that it stays where I want it to stay even after it gets wet. We did one of them and now we'll do the other. Now notice that right now, the paper towel is sticking straight up, right? But once it gets wet, that will change and it will be bending down instead because the weight of the water will push it down. Okay, now that everything's in place, we also wanna make sure that these things are sitting on top of a surface that it is okay if that surface gets wet. So that's why I used a cutting board. Okay, so now we just need to wait until our water is ready to pour. Okay, our salt water has cooled and we're ready to pour it.
as you can see, both of our jars are pretty full with water and the paper towel is all the way submerged or it's all the way in the water so that it can soak up the water and pull the water towards the middle. I can feel that this is already getting wet, okay? So now over the next little while, actually it's probably gonna take at least several hours, I'm gonna leave it overnight and we're gonna see how it looks in the morning. Um, this is going to soak up water and it's going to start to form a stalactite, okay? And then we'll see how it looks tomorrow, all right? We'll check it out together then. All right, friends, I have had so much fun today. We learned about spelunking. We learned about how caves are formed. We played with words and we got to start our experiment for making scalactites. Now, I don't wanna give away the ending, so I want you to go and make your own scalactites. I showed you how to set it up and the directions are in your learning guide this week. So all you need is some water, some salt, a paper towel, and some cups. You can do this. I wanna see what happens. And then what would be really cool is if you did a little bit of writing about what does it look like after you made your scalactite? Does it look the same as a real one in some of the pictures that we showed you? Or does it look different? Hmm, I bet it's gonna be so cool. Can't wait to see what you come up with, okay? Thanks so much for joining me and learning about caves and Spelunky and all that cool stuff today. I had a blast, I hope you did too, and I'll see you next time. Bye. Welcome to another week of Colorado Classroom. I'm so glad you've joined me. This week, we're talking all about our Earth. Today, we'll be talking about fossils. Such an exciting thing to learn about. What comes to your mind when you think about the word fossil? Hmm. Was it dinosaurs? If so, that's awesome. Dinosaurs have and continue to play an important role in our planet Earth's history. We learn about them from a very young age. In fact, second graders, I bet you know more about dinosaurs than I know. Dinosaur fossils are discovered by paleontologists every year across the globe, especially in Colorado. But dino fossils aren't the only thing that are close to home. Today, we're gonna look at some mammals and reptilian species that lived after the dinosaur reign during the Eocene epic about 56 million years ago. Are you ready? Let's go! A fossil is anything that was preserved from remains. An impression or a trace of something that was once living from the past geological age. Some examples might include bones, shells, exoskeletons, stones, imprints of animals, objects that were preserved in amber, hair, petrified wood, oil, coal, and DNA remnants.
Dinosaur National Monument is in Utah and Colorado. The rocks there contain amazing dinosaur fossils. Let's look at some vocabulary you will be hearing throughout the lesson. The first word you see is extinction. Extinction means that it is no longer living and none of its kind is left on earth. Dinosaurs are extinct. Paleontology. Paleontology is the study of fossils and a paleontologist is someone who studies fossils. The paleontologist studied the fossils. Preservation. Preservation means to preserve or to keep in the same way that it was or the same state. Decomposing. Decomposing means to break down. Here you see a fossil index or a guide for fossils. The fossil index shows different geologic time periods when fossils may have been created. Dinosaurs belong to a group known as Archaeosauruses, which include our modern crocodiles. A dinosaur's legs extend directly beneath the body, whereas the legs of lizards and crocodiles sprawl on either side. Dinosaurs can be divided into two primary branches, one having common ancestors of birds and the other having common ancestors of the lizard. The Earth's geologic time scale began when the Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago, to the Holocene epoch of today. Dinosaurs lived throughout the Mesozoic epoch starting at 251 million years ago. The Mesozoic era is also known as the Age of Reptiles and the Age of Conifers. During this time, the Mesozoic era climate varied greatly, alternating between warming and cooling periods. But for the most part, the Earth was hotter than it is today. The Mesozoic era is made up of the Cretaceous, Jurassic, and Triassic periods. During these times, dinosaurs first appeared in the mid-Triassic, and they became the dominant vertebrates in the late Triassic or early Jurassic. They then occupied the position for about 150 to 135 million years until the, it ended in the Cretaceous period. Birds first appeared in the Jurassic and evolved from a branch of dinosaurs. The first mammals also appeared during the Mesozoic, but remained small until the Cenozoic. Flowering plants arose during the Triassic or Jurassic time periods. The Eocene epoch begins about 55 million years ago and goes to about 33.9 million years ago. The word Eocene comes from an ancient Greek word meaning dawn. There was a dawn of new flora or plants during this time. Between the Mesozoic and the Eocene epoch, the KT extinction event occurred, which killed roughly 80% of all species on Earth and began the Cenozoic era. The Eocene is known for containing the warmest period during the Cenozoic. Then there was a decline in the temperature causing an ice house climate with the rapid expansion of the Antarctic ice sheet. This movement from warming and cooling climate began about 49 million years ago. At the beginning of the Eocene, the highest temperature and warm oceans created a moist, balmy environment with forests spreading throughout the earth from pole to pole. The earth would have been entirely covered in forests. During the Eocene, plants and marine faunas became quite modern. Many modern bird orders appeared during the Eocene. Oceans were warm and filled with fish and sea life. Some of the oldest known fossils 
of the modern animals we see today came from the Eocene period. Reptile fossils from this time, such as the fossils of pythons and turtles, were everywhere. The remains of a titan boa, a snake that was recorded to be 42 feet in length, was discovered in South America along with many different reptilian animals. Fossils give us clues about Earth's history that help us to understand how life has changed on our planet. A fossil is a preserved clue that's left from a plant or animal that lived long ago. They don't necessarily have to be bones or parts of plants, but they can be a variety of life such as nests, footprints, and droppings. Many fossils are preserved remains of living things that are now extinct. Remember that extinct means that it is no longer living and none of its kind is left on Earth. Some living things may have died due to natural causes or they could have died from human interference. Fossils can form in many ways and we will take a look at a couple of those. People have found fossils of leaves, seeds, and cones of plants that have lived millions of years ago as well as fossils of bones, shells, claws, teeth, and even whole skeletons. We have also discovered fossil footprints, eggs, nests, and droppings that help us to see and understand how things lived and moved and behaved. Fossils can form in different ways, but some fossils form when a living thing dies and gets buried. Over time, the soft parts that are on the body get eaten by other things. They then break down and the hard parts such as the shells, teeth, bones, or claws are left behind. Over millions of years, layers of sediment or sand and dirt rocks pile on top of these parts and they create pressure which then turn into layers of rock. The water that seeps into the area will bring in minerals. The minerals slowly replace the hard parts of the body and create a chemical change that turns into the fossil that is the same shape. Erosion slowly then takes place and causes the top layers to go back and wear away and the fossil can be found. Many fossils are found in riverbeds or on cliff sides where the water has eroded for thousands and thousands of years. Sometimes a living thing dies or gets buried under sediment. It decomposes or slowly goes away, but its outline remains in the sediment. Over millions of years, the sediment turns into rock, but an imprint of the living thing is still left behind. You probably have seen imprints of plants and shells and many other types of things on your own. Body fossils are the fossils you might be most familiar with. These are most often bones or teeth that have been mineralized or petrified. Bones are the most commonly found body fossils and are the main source of what we know about dinosaurs. Trace fossils are made up mostly of tracks and burrows. They occur when an object's shape or pattern design is imprinted into the earth, leaving a trace of what it was. The actual object is not fossilized, but instead leaves behind clues. Footprints or trackways are trace fossils, along with the pattern and texture of crocodile skin. Corporalites, or animal dung, are another form of trace fossils. They leave evidence of what the animal's behavior was, in this case, their diet. Burrow holes are also created by insects, like the prehistoric wasp and are filled in with sediment and compacted to reveal fossilized burrows. Even after millions of years, fossils share bits and pieces of life, animal behavior, and environmental aspects with paleontologists today. Plants and animals that have no hard parts are also part of Earth's story. Let's take a look at how these fossils are made. Plants like leaves and ferns may leave behind fossils as well. As plants die, they are often buried in sand or mud. 
Then over time, the sand and mud turn into rock. The plant then slowly decays and disappears. However, an imprint or an impression may be left behind as a fossil in the rock. Animals may also leave imprints as well. Their soft, thin parts of their body, such as skin or feathers, may leave an impression before decaying. The word subfossil means that it is the remains such as bones, nests, or defecations in which the fossil process is not complete. This may be because the length of time since the animal involved was living is too short, meaning that it is less than 10,000 years, or because the conditions in which the remains were buried were not the best for making a fossil. Subfossils are often found in caves or shelters where they can be preserved for thousands of years. Some types of trees may release a resin which is similar to a tree that has sap. Insects and small animals can get trapped in the resin and then over time it hardens into what we call amber. The animal inside is preserved. The resin of fossils are not considered true fossils, but they still provide very valuable and interesting clues to Earth's history, and sometimes they even contain small fragments of DNA. Woolly mammoths have been found by people trapped in ice. The ice preserves or keeps the living thing and prevents it from fully decomposing or going away. Woolly mammoths have been discovered in caves and riverbanks and were still found with their tusk fur and even their whiskers intact. A paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. Each fossil tells a story about our planet Earth. For example, fossil footprints can tell a scientist how an animal walked, if it walked on two or four legs, how big its steps were, and how it stalked other animals. A scientist can then compare living animals and fossil bones to make conclusions. Like today, our animals that eat meat, or our carnivores, have sharp teeth for tearing meat, while our herbivores, or animals that eat plants, will have flat teeth for grinding and chewing. The scientists can make a conclusion based on comparing the fossil's teeth with today's animals that living things ate either plants or animals a million years ago. Different fossils of animals' nests also show us what their behavior and what their habits were like. Fossil droppings can also give clues about what the animal ate. The fossil droppings can also show traces of plant material or bones that other animals may have eaten. Paleontology doesn't end in the field. Once you return to the lab with the fossils, they need to be properly curated or organized and processed. Each fossil is given a specific number to help us identify what type of animal it is along with other elements. This could be which teeth or bone it is and from which side of the body, left or right, it came from. The fossil is then labeled as to where it was found, who found it, and what stage it may have been living in. All of this information helps us to under, better understand the story of life and the evolution during this time. It pieces together different information to help us see the way that our world may have been. Next time you hear the word fossil, will it be dinosaurs you think of? Okay, second graders, guess what time it is? It's dance time. Ready for our brain break? We're gonna do some dancing. Here we go, ready? Keep going, keep dancing, keep moving. Keep moving.
for our imprinting activities today, you will need some type of clay or Play-Doh. If you already have it on hand, that's fine. Otherwise, here is a recipe that you can make at home. You need two and a half cups of flour, a half a cup of salt, one tablespoon of alum, three tablespoons of oil, and two cups of boiling water. You will stir together flour, salt, and alum. Then you will add two cups of boiling water, food coloring, and oil. Mix and knead until smooth. Then you are ready to use your Play-Doh for our activity. Keep it indefinitely in an airtight container in the refrigerator. For this activity, you will need materials collected from around your house or from outside. You will also need some clay or some Play-Doh. Okay, so we're gonna do another activity and this time we're gonna look at how things might imprint. So remember imprinting happens when animals with soft parts on their body might die or fall on the ground like leaves and plants and then the mud or the dirt slowly covers it and the leaves and the soft parts of the body decay and go away and leave a really cool design. So we're going to look at some imprinting today. Um, all you will really need is some Play-Doh and then you can have objects um, out of your bedroom, your house, um, you could find some outside and you could just kind of see how those look when you imprint them. So. We're gonna go ahead and do some imprinting and we're gonna see if we can figure out what they are. Okay, so here is the first one. Let's see, let's see if we can figure out what left this imprint. Okay, class. Oh, let's see. Let's look at that. That kind of left a cool design. What do you think could have left this imprint? Hmm. Let's see, Isabella, can you show us what left that imprint? Okay, so a shell left that imprint. Okay, let's try something else. Okay, second graders, what do you think left this imprint? What does that look like? Yeah, if you guessed a beetle or a bug, you were correct. You were correct. All right, let's try something else. Okay, Isabella's gonna do another one. Okay, what might leave this type of imprint? Hmm. Well, it looks like some animal paws, and I know that there's four paws, so they probably walk on all four legs. What is it, Isabella? Can you show me? Oh, we were right. It's the puppy. The puppy has four legs. So if we came across this, we would notice that um, this animal had four legs. Let's see. Okay, here's our next one. Oh, look at that. That left a whole bunch of really cool designs. What do you think that might be? Hmm, if you guessed a plant, you were correct. All right, well, we're gonna do a couple more. All right, class, so if we were out walking and we came across these footprints, we would notice that the back feet are bigger than the front feet and that there's a flat tail. So that would help us to figure out what type of animal it is. So this type of animal is a beaver and we would know that because we know that beavers have flat tails. Okay, um, let's see, let's try a couple more. All right, class, what do you think that looks like? Oh, I noticed that it looks like they have some claws in the front and that it's a bird. So Isabella, what do you think? What would this tell us if we came across these footprints? That it was a bird. Okay, and... And that it's like 
kind of a small animal. Maybe a small animal. And how many feet do you think this animal walks on? Uh, two. Two. Yeah, we see two. And I see the claws, so I noticed that they're probably some type of animal that eats other animals, maybe smaller animals. So, as you can tell, imprinting tells us lots of information about animals and tells us about their behaviors and how they eat and play. All right, thanks for joining me. Now that you have learned all about fossils, let's see if we can answer some questions. Number one, name one type of fossil that you've learned about. Did you think of one? If you named a body fossil, a subfossil, a trace fossil, or even a resin or an ice preserved, you are correct. Number two, what is a paleontologist? A paleontologist is a scientist who studies fossils. Great job. Number three, true or false. Trace fossils show us how organisms such as dinosaurs may have behaved and moved. If you said true, you are correct. Great job. Wow, we've learned a lot of really great information about fossils. I hope you had some fun. We'll see you next time. graders, I didn't see you there. You found me exploring our wonderful planet Earth, which is perfect because it is Earth Week, and bonus, we get to be learning about rocks and minerals this week. We also are in a really cool Colorado city called Boulder. And do you know that Boulder actually means a large rock? How neat is that? Anyway, as you know, we will be continuing to learn our reading and our writing skills while learning about pretty cool science topics. Let's go back to our home classroom and read our learning target. Welcome back to our home classroom. Let's read our learning target. Read along with me. Our learning target says, today I will write an eight sentence informational paragraph. Great job reading along with me, third graders. You rock. <laughs> All right, so today you're going to learn how to write an informational paragraph. And informational, hmm, what word is in that word? Informational. That's right, inform. So what do you think an informational paragraph is going to do? Did you say that it's going to inform the reader? because you're right, it is going to inform the reader. So today, you're going to learn how to write an informational paragraph while also learning how to be geologists and take care of our Earth. Super exciting. So first, let's learn how to write an informational paragraph. So when I write my informational paragraphs, I like to use a mnemonic. 
which is a device or pattern of letters or numbers that helps me remember. So my mnemonic that I use when I'm writing informational paragraphs is TEEK. Can you say TEEK? Great. So if it's a pattern of letters that helps you remember something, those letters each stand for something that will help you in your informational paragraph. So our T stands for topic sentence. Can you say topic sentence? Great job. E stands for evidence. Can you say evidence? Excellent. A stands for analysis. Can you say analysis? That one was kind of a fancy word. Great job. And then the last one is C. And you might be familiar with this one. Can you say conclusion? Yeah, so C stands for conclusion. So this mnemonic device or this pattern of letters will help you remember each of the parts of your informational paragraph. Teak. So now let's look at a deeper look at those letters to see what they actually mean. So using our mnemonic T for our informational writing, we already know that T stands for topic sentence. The topic sentence will always be your first sentence. And that topic is going to tell the readers what you're writing about. So if your whole paragraph is about blueberries, then your topic sentence is going to tell your reader, hey, you're going to read about blueberries. So your topic sentence really helps you and the reader know what the whole thing is about. That's your T. Next comes our evidence. Our evidence is what proves or explains why your topic sentence is true. So remember, we're informing our reader, so you need to have evidence, true facts about your topic. So everything has to be connected. Remember, if you're writing about blueberries, then your evidence can't be about watermelons. That doesn't connect. So your evidence will prove why this is true, and it does need to come from your text. You found that information somewhere. It was probably in the text. So now we have our T and our E. Next comes our analysis. The analysis is now going to explain why your evidence is so important. Well, why did you choose this evidence? If you think about it like um, a crime scene, if you've ever seen anything like that on TV or read about it, evidence proves what happened. So you have your topic, you have your evidence to prove that it's true. Now your analysis needs to explain, well, why is that so important? This is going to now come from your head and it's going to answer, well, so what? Who cares about this evidence? Why is this so important? And again, everything needs to be connected. If you're talking about blueberries here, you can't start telling me why watermelons are important here. Okay. And then your C stands for conclusion, which really just wraps up your whole paragraph. And then it also still needs to connect back to that topic because your whole paragraph was about one thing. And so every piece needs to be about that one thing. Now, you might be saying, but Ms. Hoy, the learning target said that we were going to learn about an eight sentence paragraph, but I only see one, two, three, four, and you're right, it is eight sentences. So, let's look at what the other sentences need to be. Right here, you have evidence one with your analysis one, but if you're a really good writer, you're going to have more than just one piece of evidence. Just like in the crime shows or the crime books, you need to have a lot of evidence to prove why it's true. So we have one piece of evidence, two pieces of evidence, three pieces of evidence. And with each evidence, you need to have an analysis explaining why it's so important. So the way that I like to remember it is T, E-A, 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 
C. So we have T, E, A, E, A, E, A, C. And now you'll see that we have eight sentences. All right, so now that you know the pieces of an informational paragraph, now we're going to read a text so we can write about it. So do you remember earlier when I told you that you were going to get to be a geologist today? Do you know what a geologist is? A geologist is a scientist who studies our earth and what it's made up of, which is rocks and minerals. And that's why I have all of these beautiful minerals with me today. Now, geologists have a very important job. Geologists can help us prevent damage from earthquakes and landslides. So if they're studying the earth, an earthquake is about the earth. And landslides also include rocks and minerals that are sliding into the roads or into um, homes. So geologists do pretty important things. They also help us get some of our natural resources that we need in everyday life. So rocks and minerals are things that are around us all the time. Rocks are going to be made up of lots of minerals. And minerals are going to be one substance that's uniform throughout, which means it's made up of one thing. So I have some gypsum here, which is made up of just one thing, which is why it is a mineral. And you can see it's pretty cool. But then I also have some limestone here, which is actually a rock that is made up of like sed sedimentary rock, which is a lot of different layers that have um, settled and then compressed over millions and millions of years. And you can actually find um, limestone, limestone naturally around um, Colorado, which is really cool. So this is a rock and then um, this is a mineral. Now we need a lot of these things for everyday life. You can actually find a mineral right in your own kitchen. Do you know what it is? If you said salt, that is correct. We have salt all the time in our food. Maybe you have it on your kitchen table. Um, salt is a mineral. It's all made up of this one uniform substance and we use it all the time. Um, but we mine for a lot of the things. And when we mine, we're actually cutting into earth. We're cutting into her and we are taking those things from her. Um, so it's a good thing for us, but it can also be a bad thing for our earth. Since we are talking about earth, we, we should be conscious humans and care about where we live, right? So like one thing that we can mine for that is actually really harmful to our planet is this right here. This is coal. Have you ever heard of coal? Yeah, it's so it actually is what we get a lot of our energy from. Maybe like when you turn on the lights or um, turn on the heat. So coal is a mineral um, that we find in our, in our earth and we have to mine for it. So we're actually going to read a text about what mining does to our planet. And we can get these really amazing things but there might be some negative side effects too, which is why I wore my mountain shirt. It says, believe in mountains, and I do believe in mountains. So let's read our text about mining mountains and the rocks and minerals we get from them. Let's go. This book is called Mountains Don't Grow Back, written by Julie Spear. Today, I saw a mining site and instantly knew something wasn't right. The trees, the grass, the rocks were gone. Something indeed was horribly wrong. The deer, the birds, the mountain goats, all had left. They had no home. Instead, I saw great big machines eating the mountain's delicious gleams. They dug and sifted and pulled and tore from the mountain's mighty metallic store. 
aluminum, granite, titanium, ore, all are needed to build more. More toys, more tools, more airplanes, more phones, more computers, more buildings, more cars, more homes. And then there's coal that's mined from the top to burn for electricity when it gets hot. And into the air spews carbon monoxide that makes the air black and icky outside. Some mountains are scraped, some mountains are mined. Some mountains are like Swiss cheese, holy inside. At first it was a little, then it became a lot. Now there's so much taking, will it ever stop? The mountain's face had changed for good. Then all of a sudden, I understood. Do mountains grow back? I asked with hope, and all I heard was a long, sad, no. My cousin, who's 13 and very smart, had a great idea, a solution start. An earthquake would fix it, he said with great zest, and my mommy answered, as she always does best. Well, yes, that's true, but without an earthquake, what can we do? A volcanic eruption would do the trick. The lava would flow and rebuild it just so. Yes, again, that could be true. But without a volcano, what can we do? Mm, time will fix it. Yes, that's true. Mother Earth always knows what to do. But it will take millions and millions and millions of years and many, many scars and many, many tears. By then, will there still be animals or computers or homes? Will there still be people or cars or phones? Do we need all those things for so short of time? When it doesn't grow back, is it really fine? The earth needs our help. We must take great pride to know where we live. We'll always survive. Be sure what you buy is made with great care. Be sure you are conscious and always aware. It needs to grow back if we take it away like trees or flowers or fruit or hay. Or make things with energy that renews every day from wind, from the sun, from the water that runs. So you'll always have a place to play and have fun. The end. Now that we've read our text, let's practice what we learned about writing an eight sentence informational paragraph. Let's go. Okay, so we have a prompt here, and a prompt just means it tells you what to write about. So our prompt says, explain how mining affects humans and earth. Use evidence from the text. So if I know that it's asking me to explain, then I know that it's going to be an informational paragraph because it's telling me to explain something or give information. And that's why I have teak here, T-E-A-E-A-E-A-C. -E 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 and for this, this is not how you make a paragraph, but this is how you make a plan. Good writers plan out their writing before they write, so that way they can edit or revise or make it better. So the first thing that we need to do is write our topic. And remember, this is what the prompt says. So if it says that we should explain how mining affects humans and earth, should we write about the ocean? I don't think so. We should be writing about how mining affects humans and earth and it even tells us to use evidence from the text. So our topic, if you remember, tells the reader what you're going to write about. Our topic needs to connect to our prompt. So my topic is going to say, mining is both useful to humans, and harmful to our planet Earth. Okay, the next thing that I need to do is now come up with my evidence. Now, my topic was pretty general. It's telling me how it's both useful and harmful. So my evidence, we always like to use some 
transition words like first, next, then last. So since this is my first piece of evidence, what do you think that I should use? That's right, I should probably use first. So I'm going to first write about how it's useful to humans because that was the first thing that I wrote in my topic. So first, mining is useful because it provides important resources such as aluminum, granite, and coal. And if you remember from our text, I learned this information from the text. I learned in that book that we can get aluminum, granite, and coal. It also mentioned, um, I think titanium ore. So all of this was from the text because our evidence needs to come from the text. Excellent job, third grader. So now I need to come up with my A. A stands for analysis and it needs to be telling me, well, why is this so important? And it's going to come from my head. So for my analysis, I need to have some linking words to connect these two. So I'm going to say this is important because, because that's the whole point of our analysis. I need to say, well, why is that so useful? This is important because we use these resources all the time to cook, build, and have electricity. Now this did not come from the text. This was coming from my head. I said, well, when do I use aluminum? Hmm, in the kitchen, aluminum foil. When do we use granite? Hmm, maybe to build things like countertops. And coal, I already learned earlier in this lesson, I can get electricity from that. So this was from the text. This one is coming from our head. So now I'm just going to finish coming up with my next E A E A C. So for my next E, well, I'm going to use that word next. I have first and then that's right. Next, next. Hmm. Well, I've already said how it's useful. Now I need to talk about how it's that's right. Harmful next. Mining is harmful because coal is a major mineral that is mined and causes pollution. Do you remember this from the text? That when there was coal, when it was burned, it would get hot. And the text said that it created carbon monoxide in the air that was sticky icky. So that was my next piece of evidence. So now I'm going to analyze, well, why is this so important? This time I'm going to give an example. I'm going to say four, example, that's a linking phrase, when coal is burned for energy, 
it produces air pollution. Do you see how these two are connected? Great job, third graders. All right, now we need our last piece of evidence. So what would be a good word for that? A good transition word. If it's our last piece of evidence, I should use, that's right, I could use lastly or finally. So I'll, maybe I'll use finally. Finally, mining is also harmful because it strips mountains leaving them empty. Did we learn that from the text? Yes, we did. Okay, my last analysis needs to connect to leaving those mountains empty. So this time I'm going to use a linking phrase that says this means, this means that Earth's natural landforms are left ruined and stripped of what was inside. That's sad. Okay, look at all of this that I just wrote. And these pieces of evidence are true and fact and they're facts that came from the text, which is why this is an informational paragraph. Now I need my last one, which is a conclusion. So I can write in conclusion, and if you remember, this needs to relate all the way back up here like a sandwich. So in conclusion, mining can be both useful and harmful. After you finish your plan, this is how your paragraph will look when you actually write it as a paragraph. Just make sure to indent your first sentence, your topic sentence, and then you can just finish writing all of the sentences onto your plan. You have T, E, A, E, A, E, A, see. All right, third graders, that's all the time that I have today, but we had a really fun day and we learned a lot. Let's go back to that learning target. Our learning target said, today I will write an eight sentence informational paragraph. Did we do that? We sure did. We also got to talk about Earth Week and learn about geologists and rocks and minerals. We also learned about the impacts of mining for some of our rocks and minerals. What a super fun day I had. And if you want to learn even more about rocks and minerals, you should follow along in your learning guide. All right, third graders, I had an excellent time with you. I will see you next time for another day of Earth Week. Bye, third graders. Thank you.